Trying to develop a reasonable understanding of what is going on in the world in terms of geopolitics and economics is exceedingly difficult. Most of us have grown up in a world dominated by corporations who actively steer our worldview via the mainstream media and educational institutions. Now, in the last decade, with the internet, we witnessed the rise of the alternative media. This helped us see past the corporate and the pro-war propaganda, but also induced in us a kind of psychosis, a permanent feeling of skepticism and paranoia. So we should all be aware that the establishment isn't always lying, and sometimes, just sometimes, the truth seems to suit them just fine. So this will be a series of videos where I share my research and invite contributions on the major questions that will profoundly affect our generation. Hopefully, we'll be able to see past the propaganda and the polarized debates to uncover some hard facts that we can actually act on. And the question for today is... How much oil is there in the world? Well, this question matters because entire industries thrive or fail depending on the abundance of oil. Oil is pretty much the main reason the world can sustain 7 billion people. I mean, mass production of our goods and services is highly oil intensive, and the food as well. On the political scene, the West installs dictators and fights various wars, um, all in oil-rich countries. Furthermore, um, the oil exploitation and transport leads to habitat destructions. Plastics and petrochemicals damage our environment. And if you were to believe the global warming alarmists, um, our exploitation of oil is going to boil our grandchildren alive as the greenhouse effect caused by carbon dioxide escalates. So, it matters. Right. Um, according to the mainstream view, oil is a finite fossil fuel formed by formerly living plants and organisms that were trapped in sedimentary rocks. Uh, and according to the much cited Hirsch report to the US Congress, uh, we are about to reach the point of maximum oil production. This window for that is from 2010 to 2015. Now, this has dramatic implications, because quite simply global economies cannot keep growing with a shrinking oil supply. Barring unconceivable scientific discovery, peak oil spells the end of mass production um, and the consumer society as a whole. This is demonstrated by the ever-escalating oil prices, which remain high even at times of lower demand. There is no shortage of experts purporting this view. Linked as a playlist with 13 of them, and in my view this hypothesis is perhaps best articulated by Michael Rupert in a documentary called Collapse. Seems like an open and shut case? Well, not quite. There's problems with this consensus, as scientific as it may be. Firstly, uh, all the oil prices are highly influenced by derivatives and financial speculation in general. Secondly, all the information we have about global oil reserves comes from two sources, and both of them have a track record and incentives to lie to us. Firstly, the oil companies. They want to downplay their reserves because this means lower taxes, and secondly, because they stand to benefit from a perception that oil is scarce. This perception drives the price up. Then there's OPEC. Um, this is an organization which has an incentive to underreport reserves, just like the oil companies, because it drives the price up, and this is basically the resource that drives their economies. However, individual countries within OPEC have an incentive to do the opposite, basically overreport their reserves, because they only have a right to sell a percentage of their reserves. Now, there is a recent cable leak uh, alleging that Saudi Arabia overreported their reserves by as much as 40%. There's more. Um, there's a scientific hypothesis that challenges peak oil. This is the theory of abiotic oil. It claims that oil is not created by decaying flora and fauna, but rather formed from non-biological compounds that are compressed into more complex hydrocarbons given the correct temperatures and pressures that are found within our planet. The theory is indeed plausible. We know that methane, which is combustible, is found all over the solar system. In fact, there is rain, there's lakes and rivers of methane on Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. 
In the right conditions, methane can be synthesized in combination with carbon dioxide to produce gasoline. This has been done in laboratories and actually is a patented process. Um, however, abiotic oil overall does lack concrete evidence. In its proponents, who are mostly Russian geologists, do not publish detailed papers and tend not to show up for peer review. Um, nonetheless, these same geologists, whose behavior seems quite suspect, uh, are the same guys who have identified where to drill and explore oil and made Russia the world's number one oil producer at 10.5 million barrels a day. And, well, in the final equation, abiotic oil only matters if the rate of regeneration is a significant fraction of what we consume. Unfortunately, this is simply not the case. Um, the abiotic oil correctly predicts that there will be regenerating wells, however, there are three registered cases out of, you know, tens of thousands of wells, and this means that replenishing oil wells constitute a completely negligible amount of um, the global oil supply. There is yet more. In fact, it is very possible, and in fact likely, that the global oil reserves are at least double the amount we're being told. According to the United States Government Accountability Office and the Director of Natural Resources and Environment, Anuke Mittal, there are oil shale deposits on the border of Colorado and Utah that total 3 trillion barrels. 1.5 of the 3 trillion are deemed recoverable. Now, the global oil supply is 1.39 trillion, so this more than doubles the global oil reserves. Here's an extract from that testimony to a congressional committee. The Green River Formation in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming contains the world's largest deposits of oil shale. Being able to tap this vast amount of oil locked within this formation will go a long way to help to meet our future demands for oil. The U.S. Geological Survey, as you noted, estimates that the formation contains about 3 trillion barrels of oil, of which half may be recoverable. As you can imagine, having the technology to develop this vast energy resource will lead to a number of important socioeconomic benefits, including the creation of jobs, increases in wealth, and increases in tax and royalty payments for federal and state governments. Now, before you start breathing a sigh of relief, you should know that shale oil is only recoverable by engaging in environmental destruction on an epic scale. And the extraction process is so laborious that the energy gained is only double the energy invested. In conclusion, I would say that for all practical purposes, oil is finite. It may or may not be abiotic. Most likely, um, oil is more abundant than indicated by the figures given to us by OPEC and the oil companies because both of these parties benefit from the perception that the oil is scarce. However, even if those low figures are true and the peak oil alarmists are right, oil can still remain abundant and affordable in terms of money. But, and this is a big but, there would be a huge price for the environment. We're talking about half a dozen toxic wastelands the size of Belgium, replacing what were their once forests and freshwater lakes and rivers. So I'd like to hear your views and find out more about the world's registered reserves, abiotic oil theory and shale oil exploitation. If you remain confused or are unconvinced by anything in this presentation, the links are in the description. That's it for today, so do subscribe and do check out criticalthoughtagenda.com. Bye all.